Direct Connection is made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities and is made possible by the generous support of our members. Thank you. Live from Maryland Public Television, this is Direct Connection with Jeff Salkin. Hi, everybody, and thanks for tuning in for Direct Connection. We begin tonight with a crash course in not crashing when the roads turn slippery. Joining us to answer your questions about all things automotive tonight is the one and only John Davis, the host of Motor Week, produced here at MPT and seen nationally on PBS stations. Thanks, Jeff. John, thanks for coming by. Oh, always a pleasure. And it always seems like bad weather. To the, when, when you're here, <laughs> the it's dark either, cloud. You yeah, know? there's either an ice storm right. or it's going to be 110 degrees, and we can talk about what happens to your car in those conditions. And, and in the case yeah. of winter weather, the idea that uh, you want to keep some gas in the tank, you want uh, decent tires and wipers and wiper fluid. You know, wipers, you know, if you haven't changed them in a year, you should have. At the very least, if they're old, take a little rag with a little alcohol and rub it along them to kind of get some of the residue of the dirt off. Does Tires, that work? Yes, it does. It, it doesn't, you know, it's not like uh, the fountain of youth, but it'll get you through that, you know, next storm and then go have them uh, replaced. Tires, proper air pressure is always a, very important. And just remember, your brakes are designed to stop you, but they won't stop you in wet as, in ice as well as they will in dry. And just because you've got an SUV doesn't mean you've got a license to speed in bad weather. Um, tire pressure monitoring systems. Oh. I didn't know I had one <laughs> until, on the car I had. Until it went until, off. It was, it was just a week or two. It was, right. it was when it suddenly got cold mm -hmm. and the thing went off. So I, you know, keep a little air gauge and check and everything was fine. Well, they're very temperamental. Uh, you could have a, a, each one of the little monitors, there's a little transmitter inside the tire, and it's looking for a fluctuation of about four or five pounds from whatever it's set at. And the best thing to do is when it is down, check the tires, put a little bit more air in them. If that doesn't solve the problem, uh, then you could be looking at a fairly expensive repair. They, they're at least a couple hundred bucks a piece to replace. Uh, but basically, they are there because of the, uh, that Firestone tire problem some years back with uh, Ford Explorers. That prompted the, uh, the federal government to start require them. What happened because back in the old days where you, you were responsible for checking your own tire pressure? These days, uh, I don't yeah, think anybody's you, responsible <laughs> for anything. You would, you would eyeball the tire and right. say, yeah, it looks, uh, looks close enough. Well, what happened was actually the, the design of the tires changed. They started to get what we call lower profile. And when those tires lose air or are low in air, they tend to heat up faster. We all drive faster now. But that Firestone problem, which really turned out to be a deficiency in how the tire was made, that really brought the whole thing about blowouts and modern tires to the forefront. And the tire pressure monitors pretty much keep that from happening as long as you pay attention to them. But they are troublesome. Back to the thing about mm. wiper blades, and I know there's yeah. more important things to talk to yeah, in your automotive bad universe, weather. but um, but yeah, I guess once a year, maybe a little bit longer. Once a year. You just you get the the streaking, and and uh, you know how much gunk there is on on the windshield right. just from the the, the road uh, grime. So, I mean, in the past. I've, I've run the wipers with the washer fluid, mm -hmm. and then you, you stop and pull it up and, and maybe wipe it down with a, with a rag. But you're saying alcohol might, I use might a little, do more than that. Yeah, I use a little bit of alcohol, using, usually isopropyl, but most any alcohol will do it. Not drench them, just a little bit. You're just getting the dirt off, and that should take care of most of the minor streaking. But if you've got serious streaks after you've done that, those blades are way past time to change them. But once a year is always good advice. Uh, Sometimes you can go a year and a half to two years, but by that point, it's just the blades are just the atmosphere is tearing them up and they just fail. The serious streaks that I yeah. have in my car are on the inside inside of the windshield, and and yeah. I've yet to find a, a good way to to clean that. Uh, where I mean, normally you get the, right. the Windex and you and you wipe it down and you and you think you did a great job until you're out on a sunny day. Uh, where the light hits you at night in a certain way, and you realize you just made streaks all over the place. There are some automotive uh, uh, glass cleaners, Meguiar's, which is kind of a trusted name in, in waxes. They make a glass cleaner that I swear by, and it's one of the few that I've found that doesn't streak. Because you're right, it looks great to the naked eye until the light comes in or starts bouncing around on the inside. And it's something about a car where the windows get dirty. Yeah. 
even I mean, in the old days, you had people breathing. smoking. Right, it must be. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I had for lunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it sticks to the glass. But it's well, also you know air getting circulated inside the uh, heating and cooling system in the car that picks up a lot of dust and throws it everywhere. Let me uh, remind our viewers: if you have a question about cars of any sort, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also tweet a question. Our Twitter address is at MPT News. So what's happening in the car biz? Well, the big news right now, besides the fact that sales keep going through the roof, and it looks like November is another very big month, um, everybody's enjoying the low gas prices. So guess what? They're buying pickup trucks like there's no tomorrow. And all of this kind of got started because there's been a lot of redesigning in the pickup trucks. And now we have a real watershed vehicle, which has just gone into production. And that's the 2015 Ford F-150, the first full-size pickup truck with an all aluminum body, shaved 700 pounds, nice boost in fuel economy. Uh, much different handling truck and, and a huge risk for the Ford Motor Company. So they're trying to clear out all of the old ones and they've got great prices on them. Meanwhile, Dodge, Chevrolet, GMC, Toyota, they're big pickup trucks. They're trying to meet that competition in price. So it's, if you want a pickup truck, this is probably the best time in years to buy one. You were telling me that the end of the year, December yeah. in general, is a, is a good time to buy? Yes, December has five or six of the top 10 selling days uh, in the year, when I mean where you get the best deal. We just had, believe it or not, Black Friday weekend is, is a very good time to buy a car as well because not too many people are looking at cars. They're at the big box stores and the dealers want you there. But through December, especially the last two weeks, good time if you're interested in buying a vehicle now. And of course, the very best day of the year to get the best discount is New Year's Eve. Let's take a phone call. This is Gary in Baltimore. Gary, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yes, I'd like to ask him a couple of questions about brake lines. Go for it. And uh, when they're sold, uh, you look on the internet. Um, I was looking for a brake line for a uh, mm -hmm. three sixteenths, and it was what I needed was double inverted. And when you look on the internet, it says double inverted uh, under the part number. Then you look the part number up at some parts stores, and it says, or even go into the yeah. store and look at the sticker, and it says standard. What is standard? Is it double inverted? Is it the standard? Is that the new standard? You know, I, I got to tell you, I'm not an automotive technician. When Jeff was saying questions, uh, you know, I like to field questions about buying new cars and so forth. However, I will tell you, I've bought a lot of parts on the Internet, and no matter what they tell you, it really comes down to the vendor. Uh, if you find a company, there are some companies that you know on the Internet sell quality parts. Uh, NAFA, uh, Rock Auto, uh, who is uh, one of uh, the sponsors that we have on uh, Motor Week. These are very reputable companies. If you're just buying the cheapest prices for parts uh, on the internet, you you don't know what you're getting. And uh, otherwise, I really can't I, I can't answer the details of the question. I'm sorry. I, I like how this guy's asking about double inverted brake lines. It's probably I, I, absolutely correct, the, the but best that's I beyond me. Is, best I could do is dirty wiper blades. <laughs> more of my. That's end. pretty good. Let's, let's that's talk, more than most. Let's talk to uh, Laura in Montgomery County. Laura, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Yes, hi. I was wanting to follow up on the comments about the um, sensors and the tires. Yes. And it's a hundred dollar repair bill if one of them goes bad. Is there a fuse in the car that you can pull that will just disable all of them, and we can go back to the old fashioned <laughs> look at the tire and you know use it use a pressure gauge and not have to go by the sensor? Laura, great question. We'll get you an answer on the air. Unfortunately, Thanks. no. Uh, all of the electrical systems are so interdependent now that if you try to disarm them, you're going to get a light on the dash. You're going to get a code into the computers, which means when you go in to have your emissions check, it'll show a code. You will fail. No you, kidding. You have really? to have the system operating, and they are expensive. It's why a lot of uh, uh, tire operators, uh, you know, people that sell new tires, like to put inert gases inside of the tires instead of traditional compressed air because it doesn't have would... as much water in it and water is what tears up these sensors. I thought that was total nonsense. No, when it's when not. the, the dealer tries to sell, we're going to put nitrogen in your tires, it's yep. only going to cost $200. Well, it shouldn't cost you $200. <laughs> it should cost you. There's a little you know, nitrogen out there. Uh, yeah. You know, it should be a very modest charge and a lot of uh, tire stores now do it actually as standard as part of their uh, operation because what they're doing 
doing is they're recognizing that a lot of compressed air uh, pumps that are used to fill tires don't have good enough water catchers on them, water gets in, and it causes these very expensive uh, tire pressure monitoring systems to fail. I thought the pitch was that that a, the nitrogen or whatever it was didn't expand that, or contract as correct. much as normal atmospheric air, and that's which is also pitch. something to talk about in terms of winter driving, because if you last checked your pressure in August, mm -hmm. things have changed. And that's probably why your uh, TPMS <laughs> went off, because air contracts at colder temperatures temperatures. And that's right, nitrogen was first seen as a way to stop that seasonal expansion and contraction, but it also has the advantage of it doesn't basically uh, uh, hold water uh, as much as just plain old air does. Back to the phones, uh, Baltimore City, this is George. Uh, George, thank you for calling. Go ahead. Hello, George, are you uh, there? We lost George. Yes. Yeah, Hi, George. George, you're on. George, you got a question? Oh, yes. Uh, I saw in the, at one of your late uh, earlier shows, you showed two battery charges, one uh, <clears throat> large size and one uh, miniature size. Yes. I want to know the difference. Is there a significant difference in either one of them? Yes, there is a significant difference. Everybody's used to those big jump starters, and that's what you're talking about. We had a big blue one on the Pat Goss segment. I've got a big yellow one at home. But the new battery uh, jump starters have lithium ion batteries. They're much, much smaller. They're much better. They hold a charge longer. And you can also do things like plug in your cell phone and your computer into them. They're very new on the market. Uh, one uh, that we have a connection with, again, on Motor Week is uh, the Die Hard Focus. Folks, and they've got one on the market, but you'll find other brands out there. They run about a hundred bucks, but they're vastly superior to the old big ones that uh, took basically large muscles to carry around. Montgomery County, this is Mike. Mike, go ahead. Yes, I have, I have well, first of all, it's a complaint. Uh, sometimes on Saturday mornings, I wait for 11 o'clock for you to come on, and all of a sudden, they have another program all with dancing or whatever it is. And I'm just wondering if that could be a fix that you could always be on every Saturday at the same time. The second question I have is, is I'm looking at purchasing either a Mustang or a Camaro. I think you've done a test drive on a Mustang. Right. Would you recommend waiting for the Camaro that's coming out next year to redesign Camaro? Thank you so much. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. On the first question, uh, sometimes uh, it's necessary for us to give way to other programs, especially during a membership period, but you can always watch Motor Week road tests and episodes at our website at motorweek.org or at pbs.org slash motorweek, or go on to YouTube and look at our YouTube channel. All of our material is there, but we'd rather you see the whole show on public television. Uh, the, the second question that I have, which I have completely forgot, what was the second question? Um, what we, oh, the Mustang Camaro or Camaro. Versus, uh, right. uh, I'm very high on the new Mustang uh, with the independent rear suspension. It's like a totally different car. The interior is spectacular. It's going to take at least a year or more for the new Camaro to come out. I, if, you're, if you're into pony cars, I wouldn't wait. I think the Mustang is going to be a huge hit. One more gripe. Yep. I accumulate all these automotive gripes until, until we get to see you. Um, it seems like mm. when you're driving at night, Everybody else is, not everybody, a lot of the headlights you see on the road have gotten oh. brighter or, yes. or more annoying or distracting somehow. Well, you've, you've had halogen, then you've had uh, the new LED headlights, and what happens with a lot of these new lights is they have a bluer cast than the old traditional incandescent lights that we always saw as kind of yellow, and the older they got, the more yellow they got. So blue is a color that really irritates the eye. So the government controls how bright these lights are, but your eye is, percepting, is perceiving something that is brighter or more irritating. And you think the uh, oncoming car has got uh, their brights on when they really don't. Right, it's one of the new the headlights. Light, right. It's either the new high intensity discharge lights, which is where this problem really <clears> started, <throat> or even some of the new LED headlights. Unfortunately, there's the only solution is a lot of the new lights also come with much better lenses that try to keep the lights down on the road. But sometimes people have accidents or they don't have the headlights adjusted properly, and so the bright lights are right at you. So and it is a big problem. Well, our, our time is short, uh, but before we go uh, to break, John and I would both mm. like to say a word about a man who was a key part of all of MPT's productions for over three decades. Frank Leung was an Emmy-winning videographer. He passed away over the weekend mm. at the age of 66. 
Frank was both an artist and a journalist and was respected and loved by people all across our state and certainly, John, by everybody here at MPT. Absolutely. If you saw something that you really liked visually on Maryland Public Television in the last 30 plus years, chances are Frank was at least one of the people behind the camera. A very lovely man, mild mannered, never, almost never lost his temper. I mean, he was amazing. But a consummate professional, uh, you mentioned artist, just a really nice guy. And I can't tell you how much he meant to all of us at Motor Week, how much he had to do with our success, and how much every one of us is going to miss Frank. There, he, he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. Frank uh, worked throughout a long yeah. illness uh, until just a few weeks ago. Our condolences go out to his family. Next time on the PBS Arts Fall Festival, the legendary Tony Bennett and the flamboyant Lady Gaga team up for a very special concert with swinging selections from their Cheek to Cheek album. When we're out together, dancing cheek to cheek. Next time on the PBS Arts Fall Festival, Great Performances presents Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga Cheek to Cheek live tonight at 10 on MPT. Tonight on MPT2. Season four of Downton Abbey left us with so many burning questions. Will Lady Mary pick Tony Gilliam or Charles Blake? Did Mr. Bates kill Mr. Green? And if so, will he be caught? Oh, I couldn't ever answer that. Please join me, Bernadette Peters, for a celebration of the first four seasons of Downton Abbey and a tantalizing and exclusive peek at season five in Downton Abbey Rediscovered. Tonight at 8 on MPT2. Joining us in the studio for this week's Your Health segment is Dr. Eric Goldberg, Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and Director of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. We want to focus on the pancreas which is an organ that maybe most people aren't even familiar with. Where is it? What does it do? Uh, the pancreas is a gland, uh, so it, um, it secretes um, uh, hormones. Uh, the biggest hormone that the pancreas uh, secretes is insulin. And uh, insulin is very important for regulating your body's blood sugar. So if you don't have insulin, uh, you can get diabetes. Uh, and so pancreas plays a very vital role in that. Uh, the pancreas also plays a vital role with digestion. Uh, and so when we eat, we have to secrete uh, digestive juices to help break down proteins, carbohydrates, fats. And the pancreas uh, releases a lot of these enzymes into the digestive juices. When, when somebody has diabetes, does that mean that there's something wrong with their pancreas or is there another set of factors? Um, I'm certainly not an expert on diabetes, but what I can tell you is that um, Certain types of diabetes are because of no, uh, the, the body has an immune reaction against uh, insulin. Uh, and then other types, the body becomes resistant to the effects of insulin. And so if you didn't have a pancreas, you don't have insulin and you can develop uh, diabetes. Or if you have some type of scarring condition in the pancreas, it's gonna lead to diabetes. People do get pancreatitis, which is an inflammation of the pancreas? That's correct. Why does that happen? Uh, there's a couple different types of pancreatitis and they have different uh, causes. Uh, there's an acute pancreatitis where uh, patients can get acutely very, very ill very quickly and develop life-threatening disease. And then there's a chronic pancreatitis where um, there's kind of months and years of uh, pancreatic injury where the pancreas becomes damaged and scarred. And once it becomes scarred, it doesn't work as well. And so somebody who has acute pancreatitis, it's typically um, in this country, it's related to either a gallstone uh, that has passed out of the gallbladder, down the bile duct, and at the end of the bile duct, the bile duct and the pancreatic duct meet, and then it blocks it up and can lead to a cascade of events that will inflame the pancreas. Uh, and the other major cause of um, acute pancreatitis in this country is uh, alcohol consumption, uh, which is a direct toxin to the pancreas. How, how can these cases be treated? Uh, it depends. So for acute pancreatitis, if um, somebody develops um, uh, life-threatening illness, the important thing is to kind of 
get them through that illness. You have to rest the pancreas. Think of the pancreas as um, it's a digestive organ and it's releasing digestive juices and these juices are designed to break down meat uh, it's designed to break down sugars, it's designed to break down fat, uh, the same things that our bodies are composed of. And if these enzymes are getting out and digesting the pancreas itself, it becomes a very painful, uh, unpleasant situation to be in, and it can trigger a lot of inflammatory processes in the body. So the first step is to really rest the pancreas, and we do this by not letting the patients eat. Uh, and that uh, will hopefully calm the pancreas down. And while they can't eat, you have to make sure they're getting fluid uh, and nutrition. And so uh, supportive care is the, the mainstay of treatment. And then uh, also getting to an underlying cause. If it's a gallstone that's blocking up the duct, you have to get the gallstone out of the, um, out of the bile duct. And we mentioned you were the head of uh, endoscopy. Is that something that can be done with a scope as opposed to at surgery? Uh, it's something that used to be done almost exclusively surgically until about 1980. Uh, and then things uh, began switching over to less invasive means. And actually a very a much safer way of doing it is by an endoscopic technique called ERCP, uh, where our scope is put down the mouth, uh, down into the intestines, right where the bile duct opens up. Uh, and from there, we can insert catheters up into the bile duct and ex extract stones out. Hey, what are the symptoms? How, how does somebody know that they're developing a problem? And, and would a patient be able to guess it was the pancreas as opposed to something else, uh, you know, in that general area. Yeah, so the main symptom of pancreatitis is pain. Uh, and this is generally a pretty severe pain that's gonna send someone to the hospital. It's not like a mild ache. It's a pretty severe pain that's in the epigastrin, which is the upper portion of your abdomen, and it penetrates into the back. Uh, other symptoms that we see are uh, nausea and vomiting. Uh, and uh, when it's severe, uh, then uh, patients can develop signs of um, organ failure. They start uh, getting problems with their breathing. They start having problems with their kidneys functioning uh, because the pancreas uh, sets off an inflammatory cascade that will disrupt a lot of different organs' functions. Let's take a phone call for you. This is Fred in Baltimore County. Fred, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, I was uh, many years ago taken to uh, the hospital with diabetes symptoms I mean, uh, gallbladder symptoms. And then when they determined that I had gall sand in my bile duct rather than stones, then they discovered I had pancreatitis and they couldn't do anything and that my pancreas healed. So after a couple of weeks, the pancreas recovered. And then they went in and removed my gallbladder and discovered it was like a piece of leather, hadn't functioned for years. But my question is, I have no evidence my, my diabetes was discovered by my family doctor. He was treating me for depression, and then I went in for a visit, and he asked about the history of diabetes in my family and checked my urine sugar, and that was high, and sent me for a glucose tolerance test, Fred, confirming Fred, I was diabetic. But my question is, I had no evidence that the, the hospital, once my pancreas had problems, that they checked me for any evidence of diabetes. Very good. And that Fred, would have seemed to have been such a simple test. Fred, thank you so much for the phone call. Any yeah. thoughts? Yeah, so uh, certainly it sounds like Fred had acute gallstone pancreatitis. So even though he didn't have a stone, he had some what we call sludge. And effectively, that's the same thing as having a stone in your bile duct because it'll travel out of the gallbladder. It'll go down, lodge at the end of the bile duct, uh, and block up the um, pancreatic duct as well. Uh, and there, people get acute pancreatitis. And the nice thing about acute pancreatitis, if there is a nice thing to say, because it, it's a, like Didn't I said, sound a, like it so far. no, it's yeah. a very painful condition. But once patients recover from an acute bout of pancreatitis, uh, in, uh, they generally recover completely. There are s exceptions to that rule when someone has necrosis or destruction of their gland. Uh, but in general, people will recover complete function from, his, from their acute gallstone pancreatitis. And so the development of diabetes 10, 20 years later after an episode, it's probably unrelated to that single episode of pancreatitis. Is there an age, in just a few seconds, is there an age where, where pancreatitis tends to occur? I think because gallstones and alcohol consumption are the main causes, um, it's, it's uncommon to see 
you know, gallstone in a 10-year-old. It's much more common to see it in someone over the age of 40. Similarly, you're not going to have a 10-year-old who's uh, an alcoholic, um, and, and takes many years of alcohol consumption to damage the pancreas. Very so good. you typically see it after the age of 30. Um, we got to leave exceptions. it there. Dr. Goldberg, yeah. Eric Goldberg, University of Maryland, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for Direct Connection, and have a good night. This program was made by MPT to serve all of our diverse communities.